Let's pray. Lord, you are indeed God forever to be praised. Lord, for your endless mercies to us who are in Christ. Lord, uh, even this morning, your mercy towards us is renewed, Lord. And so we, we thank you for that. We thank you for this uh, day, Lord, where we get to worship you with your people, where we get to hear from you through the scriptures. Lord, would you prepare our hearts, God, soften our hearts, uh, remove any distractions from our mind, anything that is preoccupying us right now, Lord, to hear from you and to, uh, uh, to, to see that Christ is indeed our treasure, that we should esteem him as he is. Lord, would you bless this morning? Would you help me? Lord, would you use me as a, as a weak vessel in your hands, uh, Lord, to, to speak your truth to us? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, please stay uh, standing for the reading of God's word. We are in Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 to 58. Matthew 13, 44 to 58. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes. And he said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. And when Jesus had finished these parables, he went away from there, and coming to his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue, so that they were astonished and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? Are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? Are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. This is the word of the Lord for today. You can be seated. Well, good morning. Uh, My name is Eddie. I am uh, one of the leaders here at the Shepherd's Church, and it's always so good to be here with the Lord's people gathering on the Lord's Day. Uh, It's almost like God knew that we need a a day to to rest and to come to to worship him, to hear from him, to open up the scriptures. And if this is your first time here, uh, welcome. And second, you should know that we we happen to to love the word of God here, because these aren't just words on a page. This isn't just an ancient book we like to nerd out on. No, this is, this is the word that is living and active. It is how God communicates to his people even still today. So, so what you get up here is uh, uh, hopefully not a TED talk or a motivational speech, but, but hopefully by the power of the Spirit an adequate exposition of what we read in these pages uh, on a weekly basis. Well, today we are in Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, and and we've seen that Matthew kind of breaks up his book into five major speaking portions by Jesus. And today we're going to be wrapping up the third of these five discourses. And in this discourse, Jesus gets into a boat on the sea while a bunch of people crowd around him on the beach, and it says that he begins to speak in parables. He begins to speak in parables. Now, parables are are typically short stories or or examples from daily life that are used to illustrate a particular truth. And and specifically here in this chapter, Jesus' focus is on the truths surrounding the kingdom of heaven. He wants to demonstrate to those who have ears to hear, as he says it, what the kingdom of God looks like. Now, so far, uh, we've seen a few of these parables. The first one being the the well-known parable of the soils. 
where we learn that as the word of God goes out into the world, as the gospel is proclaimed, it takes root and produces real and lasting fruit in some people, while for others it falls on deaf ears. And it's in the midst of this parable that Jesus explains to his disciples that, in fact, one of the reasons that he is speaking to them in parables is so that he can both reveal and conceal these truths. He reveals these truths to those who are willing to hear, and he actually conceals the truth from those whose hearts have already been hardened against him. Jesus says in verse 13, This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. That should serve as a warning for all of us, really, to pay attention to these parables in such a way that we receive these truths with open hearts and open ears. And we've also seen the parable of the weeds, which tells us that both weeds and tares will grow together in such a way that is indistinguishable now within the the visible church, but that will be made clear on the day of judgment. And finally, we've seen the parables of the mustard seed and the leaven, where we see the gradual growth of the kingdom as, uh, as it progresses throughout church history. Well, in our passage, we will get what I would count as, as four more parables regarding the kingdom of heaven, as well as, as a narrative section. And this passage as a whole will help us to consider the right response to the kingdom. That is our title for this morning, The Right Response to the Kingdom. What do we do with it? How do we respond to this kingdom that Jesus talks about? Now, unfortunately, he doesn't give us a a simple definition of the kingdom of heaven, right? It'd be great if he did, maybe like a small inspired glossary in the back of our Bibles, that would be really nice. But we can can still fit together some of these pieces, right? Like last week, Pastor Max gave us a a few categories to help us understand the uh, really multifaceted nature of this kingdom. We said first that the kingdom is both present and future. The kingdom is at hand, like Jesus says, but it's also coming, Second, that the kingdom is both spatial and spiritual, that Christ rules in the hearts of people, and yet there is a a, a spatial aspect to it as the gospel goes out into different geographies. And finally, that the kingdom is both visible and invisible, that there is the outer visible church, what we see with our eyes, and yet, as we read in 2 Timothy 2.19, only the Lord knows those who are his. Another definition by uh, theologian Patrick Schreiner, goes like this. The kingdom is the king's power over the king's people in the king's place. The kingdom is the king's power over the king's people in the king's place. Now, uh, as we read our Bibles, that, that changes over time, doesn't it? For example, in the Old Testament, God is ruling over the people of Israel in a, in a particular place. And, and we, can, we can talk about the, the tabernacle and then the temple and so on. But when Jesus comes and says that the kingdom is at hand, he has in mind something quite new. That God will now rule in the hearts of all of those who put their faith in Christ and receive him as their king. So as we dive into our text, our big idea for this morning will be this. The right response to the kingdom is to joyfully receive all that it entails. The right response to the kingdom is to joyfully receive receive all that it entails. The call is to receive not just a part of the kingdom. There is no such thing as one foot in and one foot out. The call is to receive the kingdom entirely and to do so with joy. To see Christ for who he is and to respond appropriately as his disciples in this kingdom. So we'll look at this passage in four parts. And our first point is that we must wonder at the worth of the kingdom. That is our first point. Wonder at the worth of the kingdom. In verses 44 to 46, we have two parables that are similar in meaning and structure. And in both parables, Jesus compares the kingdom of heaven to a man who finds something very, very valuable. And again, in both scenarios, the response is the same. The man sells all that he has in order to obtain the thing he found. Now, in our first parable, that thing is a hidden treasure. 
Ooh, the stuff of stories, right? Probably including pirates. Now that might make for a fun element in a kid's story, but in those days, this was, this was serious business. See, if you like won the lottery today, you might, you know, after like paying more than half of your winnings to the government, uh, you'd probably go to the bank and deposit it into your account, or maybe you create some kind of trust fund where it could be protected. But in those days, if you happened to uh, have some kind of treasure, it was often buried for safekeeping. And, and so maybe the most likely scenario that Jesus envisions here is that, is that of a peasant who was maybe working on the field of a wealthy landowner, and he stumbles upon this treasure. Now, the point is not to think about, like, what is the morally right thing to do here? Should we tell the guy? Uh, you know, we shouldn't be overanalyzing the parable in this way. The emphasis that we have here from Jesus is, is on what the man does in response to finding this treasure. That's what we need to see. Now, the first thing that he does is actually he covers it up. He covers it up. Now, he's doing this because he wants to ensure possession of it, right? Right? He is so thrilled about finding this treasure that he wants to make sure there is no one else who can get to it first. He's worried that he might somehow lose it. And so the second thing that he does is he goes and sells everything that he has in order to buy this field which contains this treasure. I mean, I mean from an economic perspective, this makes sense, right? Because the treasure was probably more than his net worth, so to say, we, in our days. So he's very willing to buy this field for however much it costs because once he gets the field, he's got the treasure. And a key phrase here is that he does this out of joy. It says, in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has. This is a a voluntary, joyful surrender of all things for the sake of this great treasure. Now, our second parable is very similar Except here, that the character, uh, 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 except here, our character is specifically a merchant who is looking for high-value pearls. And one difference worth noting here is that while the man of the first parable seems to have stumbled upon that treasure, here the merchant is actually intentionally searching for some kind of fine pearls. Now, in those days, it was common for, for divers to seek out pearls like in the Red Sea or in the Persian Gulf with some rare pearls being worth uh, the equivalent of even millions of dollars in our day. And so the merchants would then buy these pearls from these divers and then hopefully sell them for a profit elsewhere. Now, of course, the point was never the pearls themselves, right? But the money that could be made from them. This is how they they made their living. But the merchant in Jesus' parable ultimately finds a pearl that is so valuable so expensive, so precious, so rare that he was, like the man in the first parable, willing to sell all that he had just so that he could have this pearl. Now, the point of these two parables is not so that we can, that we, that we can somehow buy our way into God's kingdom. I'm sure some prosperity gospel preacher somewhere has tried to pull that. But in Isaiah 55, 1, God invites his people into a covenant relationship with himself. And here's what he says. He says, come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. You can't buy your way into the kingdom. No, the point of these parables is that the hidden treasure and the fine pearl were in fact priceless. Such that they were worth the total and complete surrender of every other good thing. These are meant to be symbols of the kingdom, and more specifically, I think the treasure and the the pearl of great price are each meant to signify Christ himself. Some have suggested that maybe the field is like the, the visible church, that you can't have Christ without the church. But either way, the key is that Christ himself is the great treasure. He is the fine pearl that we find when we find the gospel. Because the gospel is not simply that God wanted to demonstrate his love for us. It's that he wanted to do so by giving us himself. He's the great prize. He's the treasure. He is the costly pearl. Now sure, there there are many blessings, as we said this morning, that come with uh, membership in this kingdom. But all of those are really nothing without the main thing, and that is Jesus himself. Like if you became a Christian but somehow missed that part... Like you thought this was going to be a fun time or maybe you'll, you'll found, find a good spouse at church or something or, or, or there's just going to be a good group of friends here. But I'm sorry, you've missed the main thing. Jesus is what makes the kingdom of heaven priceless. When you enter the kingdom, you get him. 
And like both parables attest to, this treasure is worth giving up everything. The Apostle Paul is a worthy example of this kind of life. Before his conversion, Paul had it going pretty good, right? In Philippians 3, he talks about this, that he was, a, that he was an educated, zealous, well-respected Pharisee who made a living persecuting Christians. But then after he discovered this great treasure of the kingdom, here's what he says in Philippians 3, starting from verse 7. He says, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. And he says, indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. You see, Paul was willing to suffer the loss of all things if necessary, and count them as nothing so that he might gain this great treasure, none other than Christ. And like the man of the parable, Paul did this joyfully. All right, if you've read the book of Philippians, what, what does it say repeatedly? He's going, rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. Why? Because I have Christ. I don't need anything else to satisfy my soul. Oh, that that would be our attitude, right? Does your life display that kind of contentment with Christ? Or is there another treasure in your heart that needs to be buried? Are you messing around with, with less expensive pearls? One commentator puts it this way, whenever any man renounces the thing that is closest to him, when the lover of money renounces his covetousness and the lover of pleasure his pleasure, then each is selling what he has that he may buy the field which contains the treasure. Until you see Christ as your glorious, priceless possession, you will continue on with a firm grip on things that have relatively no value. These parables serve as a warning to the believer who has become lax, and, and, and also a plea to the unbeliever who has yet to discover the kingdom of heaven. For the believer, this should remind us that we are to rightly regard our Lord and Savior as our prized inheritance, both now and in eternity. Maybe you've lost sight of that. Maybe you've become too preoccupied with other things such that this treasure has once again been buried. I would encourage you, come back and take another look at your Savior. If I could commend one book that would encourage you to meditate on this treasure, I would say, read The Glory of Christ by John Owen. It's so rich. We have to continually realign our gaze on Christ, don't we? We are forgetful creatures, let's be honest. Which is why we should not grow weary of, of coming here, of, of singing worship songs, of reading scripture, hearing it preached, being in community, serving the body. Instead, let's embrace these things as a reminder of the worth of the kingdom. Now to the, one, now to the one who has yet to discover this pearl of great price, if you're like, I don't really see what all the fuss is about, I just go to church to kind of get out on Sunday morning, may, may these parables convince you to receive the kingdom with joy. Because let's be honest, there is nothing in this world that has satisfied your soul. And if I might let you in on a little secret, there is nothing that will outside of Christ. And so whether you are seeking for something like the merchant was, or if you're not looking for anything at all, you just happen to be walking in a proverbial field, I would encourage you to look to Jesus. Repent of your sins and believe in him, and your soul will indeed rest satisfied in Christ. The right response to the kingdom is to joyfully receive all that it entails. It means that we must wonder at the worth of the kingdom, and it also means that we must be able to discern the divisions of the kingdom. That is our second point for this morning. Discern the divisions of the kingdom. In verses 47 through 50, we have our, our third parable for today. Now, if you were here last week, you'll quickly notice that this parable with the fish is, is very similar to that of the parable of the weeds. Like, just as we had the wheat and the tares growing together, so we have both good and bad fish being gathered by a single net. But in the end, both parables, uh, in the end of both parables, there's a kind of a separation, a sorting that occurs, right? In the parable of the weeds, uh, at the end of the age, 
of the end of the age was compared to a harvest with the angels being reapers, while in this parable, the end of the age occurs when the net is full. And similarly, the angels come out and separate the evil from the righteous. In both parables, we have this nearly identical clause that the evil will be thrown into the fiery furnace, and in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But while the focus of the the weeds and tares seems to be the current mixture of both good and bad in such a way that it's sometimes indistinguishable, right? The focus here is more so on the separation that will occur in the future, at the end of the current church age. Jesus uh, begins this parable by comparing the kingdom of heaven to a net that is thrown into the sea. Now, the kind of net that he's describing here is not your typical fishing net in those days, but one that's more specifically called a a drag net. This would have been much larger and uh, wider, and uh, they would often attach floats to the top and and sinkers to the bottom so that, uh, as you can imagine, you would be covering a large area of this body of water. And uh, and, and so you would naturally be catching a ton of fish, right? You'd be catching a lot of fish, and the caveat is that you're catching everything indiscriminately. As the parable puts it, this net would gather fish of every kind. So you might be catching a lot of the good stuff, but you're also catching with it a lot of the stuff that you're not particularly interested in. Like according to the Mosaic Law, for example, the Jews were only allowed to eat anything in the water that has fins and scales, so... No grilled octopus for dinner, no eel, things like that. And so it was, it was common in big fishing towns like Capernaum to see fishermen sitting on the beach reviewing their day's catch and sorting through the good fish that they would keep versus the bad fish that they would then throw out. This is the scenario that Jesus gives. Now he goes ahead and explains some of it to his disciples. He says, so it will be at the end of the age. Again, the fishermen are like the angels who will come out and separate the evil from the righteous, the good fish and the bad fish. Now, because he's talking about the kingdom specifically, I think it's appropriate to understand the net as being the visible church. In other words, everyone who claims the name of Christian, those who participate maybe in the corporate gathering of the church, including everyone who is not truly born again, including all those who go just for tradition's sake, And as history progresses and as the gospel goes forth and God advances his kingdom, as one commentator puts it, men of all shades of moral character have the gospel preached to them and find themselves within the limits of the visible church, including those who call themselves Christians but have really little to no idea about what it really means. The grim reality is that just as there are tares among wheat, there are all kinds of fish that are caught up in this dragnet, and some will ultimately be thrown out. Because when the net is full, which I think refers to the the full number of God's elect, when the net is full, there will be a kind of sorting, a deliberate division between the evil and the righteous. And of course, the righteous here, the good fish, so to say, are not inherently righteous on their own, right? But as Revelation 7.14 puts it, these ones have washed their robes and made them white, in the blood of the Lamb. It's the ones who have put their trust in Christ and who have received his righteousness. It is on that basis that they are entering into the eternal kingdom. At the same time, those who have willfully rejected Christ will face the infinitely holy God on judgment day. And I think one of the warnings that's implied here in this parable is that you don't get to stand before God on judgment day and point to the net and say, well, the net got me here. The net got me, like, look, there's my buddy from church. I mean, I, we, we served in all these ministries. We were hanging out of the net. We were all going in the same direction. We were just caught up in this thing called church. It was a good time. But like we read earlier, we, like we read earlier in Matthew 7, Jesus will respond to such people with the words, I never knew you. Listen, you're attendance in church, your participation in the external aspects of the kingdom of God, these things don't give you a free pass into eternity with him. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. The descriptions of hell, then, that we see here are not just thrown in there arbitrarily, 
Jesus wants us to see the excruciating, eternal realities of those who reject the kingdom. Now, pop culture makes it seem like all the fun people are going to be there, right? It'll be a good time. No. Jesus gives us a very different picture. It's a, it's a sobering picture. It is a place of eternal, physical torment. It is a place of extreme sorrow. It is a place that is absent from the gracious presence of God. And if we think that that, that seems somehow unfair, it's because we haven't really grappled with God's infinite holiness and our own depravity. In fact, what's unfair is that God would provi- provide a way out of that. That God would show us mercy. What's not fair is that he would send his own son to pay for our sins so that we who were once his enemies might be reconciled to him. That's not fair. But that is the grace of God that he has put on display in the gospel. And if you are here and if you have not trusted in him, you need to realize that, that your showing up to church even is a grace of God. Just don't stop there. Don't trust in the net. Don't trust in your own works. Don't trust in your own abilities. Rather, let Christ alone be the object of your faith. And I pray that you joyfully receive this kingdom of heaven. In the next two verses, we get our final parable and also our our third point, and that is this. Train in the truths of the kingdom. Train in the truths of the kingdom. As Jesus explained earlier in the chapter, one of the reasons that he speaks in parables is so that some might understand as God sovereignly reveals the truth to them and so that actually others might fail to understand as their heart has already been hardened against him. It's why Jesus says to the disciples back in verse 16, blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. In other words, he's like, you can and should be starting to get this. And so here in verse 51, as Jesus wraps up his discourse with all of these parables, he pauses and asks the disciples, have you understood all these things? He's like, are you, are you tracking so far? Are you beginning to see what the kingdom is? Because remember, he, he's not interpreting every parable for them either. And so the disciples answer, yes. Yes, we do. Now, I, I kind of laughed at the thought of that. Like, I don't know about you, but I, first of all, I probably would have been like, you know, could we go over the, the mustard seed thing again, you know? It's like, just by way of review. But their answer is just like, yes. May, maybe a little overconfident, but, but Jesus doesn't rebuke them here. So, so we shouldn't doubt the possibility that they are at least beginning to understand on some level. They're beginning to put together some of the pieces. But at the same time, we know from the rest of the Gospel of Matthew that this understanding was not yet complete and mature. Because in chapter 15, they're going to ask Jesus to explain another parable to them, and he responds, are you also still without understanding? And in chapter 16, the disciples are discussing what Jesus means when he's talking about the leaven of the Pharisees, and he says, do you not yet perceive? How is it that you fail to understand that I did not speak to you about bread? And of course, as things come to a climax with the trial and the crucifixion of Jesus, I mean, we got Peter uh, ends up denying him three times. Judas betrays him, and then the rest of the disciples desert him. So in light of the rest of the book, their understanding has not yet fully matured to the point that they are, that they have an untethered commitment to the kingdom of heaven. Now Jesus' response is another short parable that that seems somewhat puzzling. In verse 52, he goes, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house, who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. Now, it's interesting that Jesus uses the word scribe here because I I think that gives us a clue as to what this parable means. A scribe in those days was someone who was very well versed in the Mosaic law and really in the entire Old Testament. And interestingly, God's law in places like Psalm 119 is actually compared to a treasure. For example, the, the psalmist in verse 72 of that psalm says, The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. So the scribes, we could say, were in some sense keepers of the old treasure, of the Mosaic law, and of the old covenant. They were responsible for dispersing that treasure to God's people during that time, for teaching them the law, 
And so what I think Jesus is doing here as he is talking specifically to his disciples is that he is referring to a new kind of scribe, one who has been trained in the kingdom of heaven. In fact, that word trained is actually a different form of the word disciple. So this is just someone who has been discipled in the ways of the kingdom, instructed in the ways of Jesus under this new emerging covenant. The parable is that this new kind of scribe who has been discipled in the ways of the kingdom is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure old things and new things. Now, if the scribes of that day were were keepers of the old covenant law, the old treasures, so to say, then the disciples of the kingdom, these new scribes who have been trained in the ways of Christ, need need to be able to understand the fullness of God's revelation the old and the new, the whole counsel of God's word, which means we don't throw away the Old Testament. Rather, we seek now to understand the old truths in light of the new things that we see from Jesus and his apostles in the New Testament. He's going, if you really understood all these things, if you have understood the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, then you will know that everything I have explained to you, while it may be new to you, is is actually just a revelation of things hidden until now. And we've seen this all throughout the Gospel of Matthew, right? Like back in the Sermon on the Mount, as Jesus was interpreting the law to them, he wasn't really giving them anything brand new. He was interpreting to them the heart, the true intention of the law that had always been there. And he says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And then here in this discourse on the parables from last week, we know that he is in fact fulfilling the words of Psalm 72, which go like this. He says, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. So in the teachings of Jesus, we see this blend of continuity and discontinuity of things that were meant to point to him and be fulfilled in him, things like the sacrificial system, of things that were revealed in the old that still very much apply to us, like the Ten Commandments, for example, and of things that are actually new, like the gospel going out to the Gentiles now, the the death and resurrection of Jesus that happens later, the coming of the Spirit, the baptism of professing believers, new scriptures for the church of God. There are, in fact, some new things that arrive on the scene, but it doesn't mean that we do away with everything from the old. See, the scribe who's discipled in the kingdom must know how to be able to use both kinds of treasures, the old and the new. We don't discard the treasures of the Old Testament like the heretic Marcion did in the early church, but rather, as one theologian puts it, I love this, it says, Christian students of the Old Testament must pass by the cross of Jesus Christ on their return to the Old Testament, and as such, they can never lose their identity as a Christian. At the same time, we have to understand the new treasures, the truths about the kingdom that we see written down for us in the New Testament. We have the privilege of living on this side of the cross. Things that Old Testament saints looked forward to by faith, we now look back on with more clarity than ever before. We can't take that lightly. We need to revel in the word of God. Work hard to understand the entire story of redemption. Like when you hit a hard text, don't just give up and move on. Ask somebody for help. Look for good resources that can guide you. And then, really the key here is to teach those things, right? Teach those things to your family, to your children and your grandchildren, to your fellow believers. Like the master of a house who was able to take out both old and new treasures, may we master the scriptures sufficiently to be able to put on to to put christ on display using the entire counsel of the word so if we're to joyfully receive the kingdom of heaven we should train in the truths of the kingdom and finally our last point is this we must honor the head of the kingdom we must honor the head of the kingdom We come now to the end of this third discourse in the book of Matthew, and we begin what would be the third narrative portion. In verse 53, we read that when, we, when he had finished these parables, he went away from there, and he came back to his hometown, which would be the small town of Nazareth. 
Now, it's likely that, that he hadn't come back here to his hometown for a while as he was doing his public ministry in the area around Galilee. Because all the way back in chapter 4, when Jesus begins his ministry, we read that he withdrew into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea. And so all these people who grew up with him, who knew his parents and family, they finally get to see this local star come back. They've seen the local newspaper articles about him. He's been the talk of the town for some time. Well, now they get to see the real thing with their own eyes. And so he comes back to his hometown, and where does he go? Well, he begins to teach in the synagogues. Now, already, this would be a surprise for anybody who knew him. Uh, Synagogues would have been a a central place in town to worship God, to hear the word, uh, to hear the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures at that time, read and taught And while there were some opportunities for regular commoners to participate in the readings and teachings, it wasn't common to hear the kind of wisdom coming out of a commoner like Jesus, especially in a small town of Nazareth. Jesus was, of course, raised observing the Mosaic Law. He was doing all that. He was learning the scriptures. But, I mean, this was not like an Apostle Paul, for example, who says that he was rigorously trained at the feet of the renowned teacher Gamaliel. Jesus wasn't formally trained. He wasn't brought up to become a Pharisee. He was just the carpenter's son. He was supposed to take over his dad's business. He was a nobody living in this small town. And so the people of Nazareth are astonished, and they ask, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? It's a fair question to ask. What is the source of this man's authority? What is the source of his wisdom and of his miraculous works? It's a question that really every reasonable person should ask and investigate. Our faith isn't just like a blind faith. That's a good question to ask. How did Jesus, a nobody from Nazareth, teach and perform miracles and then go on to die and rise again from the grave such that the entire course of history would be changed? Where did he get that from? And the answer will determine how you ought to respond to the kingdom of heaven. Will you honor the head of this kingdom, or will you reject him? Well, the people of Nazareth decided on the latter rather than the former. Rather than considering the possibility that there is a supernatural and divine work of God happening before their eyes, instead of asking questions, instead of asking, is it at all possible that this hometown kid is in fact the son of David that we have been waiting for? Like how crazy, but also like how wonderful that would all be. They instead reminded him of his humble origins and to, and, and to his family. They go, ah, but we know where you came from. You think you're somebody, but you're just like the rest of us. You're the carpenter's son. We know your mother Mary. We know of all your brothers. And they just like start listing them off. They're like, there's James and Joseph and Simon and Judas. None of them have what you got. They're not special, but look, your, your sisters are here. Verse 57 puts it this way, they took offense at him. That word means that they were led into sin because of Jesus. They were repelled by him. It's the same word that Jesus uses back in chapter 11 when he was talking to the disciples of John the Baptist. He says, go and tell John what you see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. There's that word. Well, the people of Nazareth, even though they had heard the reports and possibly even seen some of these miracles for themselves, even though they heard his incredible wisdom as he taught from the scriptures, they took offense at him. They turned him down. Jesus responds with a a kind of proverbial saying. He says, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. Now, this was likely a common proverb back in the day, and it's not hard to see the uh, the truth in this. I mean, I think there's something about human nature. Perhaps it's a kind of pride or jealousy that causes us to be more receptive towards an authority figure outside of our family and friends and neighbors. I mean, think of the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. Like, if God calls on a man to be a prophet in Israel, and he visits from another town, like, wow, what an honor. This prophet of God from Jerusalem. But if I grew up with little Habakkuk, there's a baby name for you idea. 
when Habakkuk grows up and is now suddenly the, a prophet of God, I might have some questions. Like, I'm a bit skeptical all of a sudden. Not that he was a bad kid, it's just, just kind of weird because he was my neighbor. Like, how come I didn't get chosen? He must think he's special. Well, here we have not just any prophet, but the, the great prophet, priest, and king. The promised Messiah from the line of David, the Son of God, the one about whom all the other prophets of old spoke, and yet he is dishonored in his own hometown. We read that because of their unbelief, Jesus did not do many mighty works there. He was not about to perform miracles for a people whose hearts were already turned against him. That word unbelief is not used lightly here. It is a, is a word that is especially used for those who reject Christ altogether. In contrast, when the disciples fail to grasp something, Jesus in his compassion will often say something like, oh, you have little faith. You have little faith. How many of us would fall into that category? <laughs> it's not a bad place to be, by the way. Weak faith is still true faith, even as we pray that the Lord grows it. But the people of Nazareth didn't just have a, a weak faith. They did not believe in him at all. Many people today will believe in Jesus as a, as a historical figure. Some will go so far as to acknowledge that he maybe did some miraculous things, but still fail to honor him as the Son of God. This was no ordinary prophet, as the Muslims claim. This was not simply a good teacher. The question for you is, will you honor him for who he really is? As the King of kings and the Lord of lords, will you honor him not just as a good teacher, but as the supreme head of the kingdom of heaven? Because this Jesus didn't just come to teach some things and impress some people with miraculous deeds. This wasn't some kind of circus show. Ultimately, he came to die and to rise again. You see, all of us, by default, have disowned and dishonored this king. Because of our parents, Adam and Eve, we have broke, who, who broke the law of God in the Garden of Eden, all of us since then have been following in their footsteps because we were all born with a sinful, fallen nature. Like each of us could write out Ephesians 2.1 on our spiritual resume, that we were dead in our trespasses, that we were... Uh, uh, dead in our trespasses, sins, uh, in the sins in, in which we once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. And because of our sin, we have been separated from God. Because the God who created all things and sustains all things is also an infinitely holy God. He is a God who is perfectly good and righteous and just. He is a God of light and darkness cannot dwell with him. And so what God did is that he entered into that darkness. The second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, took on flesh and dwelt among us, we read. This was the man, Christ Jesus. Conceived by the Holy Spirit, born in the humble town of Nazareth, raised a carpenter's son, God in the flesh experiencing tiredness and hunger and sickness and probably getting some splinters in every way like us and yet without sin. This Jesus lived a perfect life in obedience to the Father. He never once succumbed to temptation but was faithful unto death. And in his death on the cross, in his love, he took upon his shoulders the sins of of the world. He took the punishment that we deserved, bearing the wrath of God against sin, covering the sins of his people. Christ died a substitutionary death. And then three days later, he rose again victorious. And he is now seated at the right hand of God where he is ruling and reigning. And the good news is that all who come to him, all who repent of their sins and believe in him now, all who honor this king will receive his righteousness free of charge. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Think about this. Jesus did not require anything of the people of his hometown, except that they receive him. That's it. That they believe in him. He didn't require that they do any penance, 
He didn't give them a list of grievances. I mean, after living there for like 30 years and knowing them, I'm sure some, some of them must have sinned against him. Some reparations would have been nice, despite his innocence. But, but all, of them he, the, all that he required of them was that they receive him by faith. That they believe he is who he says he is. That kind of faith is a faith that doesn't just believe the facts, but completely trusts in this king. It's the faith that is accompanied by repentance and a new heart that now joyfully desires obedience. It is a faith that now sees this king as a treasure that was once hidden to them, but now revealed. And if you have not taken hold of this treasure yet, do so today. Repent of your sins and believe in him. Receive him with joy. For the Christian, be encouraged because Christ has already accomplished salvation on your behalf, and you can rest secure in him. And while many of us have already become members of God's kingdom, may we, continually, uh, may, may, may we continue to joyfully receive now the work of the Spirit in our lives as he chips away at our hearts. And thank God for his word, which reminds us of how we ought to respond to the salvation that has already been given to us. We ought to wonder at the worth of the kingdom. We discern the divisions of the kingdom. We train in the truths of the kingdom, and we honor the head of this kingdom. That is Christ, our Lord and King. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we thank you that you loved us so much that you would send your son to pay the penalty for our sins, to rise again for our justification so that we who were once enemies might be made right with you. Lord, we did not deserve any of that. We did not deserve any of this treasure that we have in Christ, in the kingdom, Lord. And so, lest we forget, Lord, help us to once again take hold of that. And if anybody here has not yet, would they do so for the first time? Would you give them new hearts, new eyes spiritually, Lord, that they would see Christ as their treasure, that they would honor the head of this kingdom. Lord, would you continue to chip away at our hearts to mold us into the image of your Son? Would you sanctify us this week and the rest of our lives, Lord? We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank mm-hmm. you.